everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Recovery Center's virtual online Ask Lee RC, and this is episode two. Yay. Yay. And today we have a special guest with us over the phone, and it is Renee Capacci, and she is the brain behind this operation that we're at right now. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> Renee actually came up with the idea for the Recovery Center. How many years ago is that, Renee? Um, conceptually, it was put in place on paper, I want to say 2005. Wow, so 15 years. And we've been open for 14. Right, yeah, we've been open for 14. And Renee, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on. We just would really like to hear the story um, of what, what your idea was for the Recovery Center, what you think about it now, what you'd like to see differently, uh, see differently, what you think we're doing well, um, just kind of the soup to nuts. Sure. Uh, and, you know, in order to kind of talk about the history of the Recovery Center, I actually wanted to take it back a little bit further to create the context. Okay. Um, so that, you know, for people that aren't aware, that they have a better understanding of the bigger picture of, um, you know, kind of the, the, the history of their movement in a, in a capsule, I guess. You right. know, because originally the, the, the history and all of that, um, the time back is early, the late 1970s, early 80s, as far as a, a grassroots movement among um, consumers who at that time referred to themselves as ex-patients or survivors. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was very much so. Their initiative, they, it was kind of a civil rights movement, and the goal of that movement was to shut down asylums, um, to mm -hmm. advocate for major, major changes where abuses were perceived to be occurring in the system, keeping in mind that back then the, the hospitals were used much more um, than they are today. So a large percentage of people with, with an enormous were being held in hospitals. Right. Um, so out of all of that, though, you know, it eventually came, uh, the, the movement shifted a little bit towards the idea that, you know, maybe we should create an alternative to traditional mental health treatment. Because so, so we don't like the way they do it. Let's do it ourselves with yeah. the mentality. Yeah. Uh, so that that started to happen in, in Hampton County. And, and actually, Hampton County was one of the first in not only Ohio, but in the country to establish what were then called consumer operated agencies. Okay. Um, and in Hampton County, we, in the late 80s, both Mighty Vine Wellness Club and Cape Social Club opened and then in the early 1990s the consumer network opened and the consumer network is most closely aligned with what the recovery center is today all of those were funded by the mental health board then called the mental health uh, board now it's mental health recovery services board unfortunately in the um the, the early 2000s um the consumer network in Cape started to have financial struggles and they were not able to sustain they attempted they worked and they attempted to sustain that way, but ultimately they closed in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, and Mighty Pine Wellness Club and the Warm Line um, became a part of Icon Rehabilitation Services. So that left a pretty big gap yeah. uh, and, a, and a significant concern for me personally because it was also during that time period that I was going through in and out of the hospitals that I was uh, a part of the treatment system. Um, and so, uh, even though I wasn't heavily involved in the consumer agencies back then, um, I knew that it would carry a significant value for people. Mm -hmm. um, there, was a, there was a significant change that occurred, and it, that change that occurred is what led to the recovery center being different. Um, during the, the late 1990s and uh, mid 1990s, early 2000s, there was a strong movement across the country and Ohio towards the COVID oriented care. And mm -hmm. at that point, you know, up until that point, the conventional belief was that people with serious mental illnesses couldn't get better, that they couldn't work, um, and even that they couldn't like necessarily live alone. Right. And the goal, you know, the goal heavily in treatment was to stabilize and maintain medications. Okay. That it, that was kind of what is today referred to as a medical model of services, of treatment. And that is the model that the, the previous consumer agencies were also operating under. So even though they were consumer-run, 
they were running oftentimes with the focus on the, the same focuses as the system. You know, they were about peer support, but not necessarily focused on uh, recovery. Okay. So oftentimes they were also illness focused, focused or mm -hmm. deficit focused. Um, you know, I, you know, I mentioned that from a personal perspective, I managed to experience mental illness at a time in transition in our systems. I had, from 1989 to 99, I had experienced all of the devastations of mental illness. You know, I had been in the hospital over and over and over again. Um, my, I was working on my doctorate at the time. I, uh, that was all that continued interrupted. I lost my job at the college. I lost friends. Um, you know, I endured ECT or, you know, electric convulsive treatment, um, stop treatment, put on disability. And, and I was in a system of care at that point that was really the focus was on all of the symptoms, the deficit. Mm -hmm. They were both kind of taking care of me or protecting me. Um, and, and, and that, that wasn't working for me. The concept of stability and maintenance. I knew it wouldn't work, it wasn't working. So in the late 90s, I started searching for resources that would offer me something different, something that would be better, something, frankly, that would give me a reason to live. I mean, yeah. I was going through episodes of being suicidal, um, and I knew that I could not continue um, to live if I was going to just be in this system where everyone around was. My life was about nothing but my illness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I started doing some research. I started looking into to options for myself first um, that would give me a chance to take control of my illness, that would give me some opportunities. Um, and, and then, you know, and I, I started just changing my own life through the resources I came across. Yeah. I was very fortunate because during that same time period in the early 2000s, the OMAS at that time, the Ohio Department of Mental Health, but now it's the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, was uh, funding grants. They were funding recovery grants. And one of the counties that received one was Hamilton County. And that was the beginning of a transition to a recovery uh, philosophy of care in Hamilton County. As wow. part of that grant, you know, I wrote most of that grant, but then also I applied for the grant coordinator position and was blessed to get that position. Oh, wow. Wow, that's awesome. So in my personal recovery journey, it was huge because even though I was still working, I, I mean, I'm not still, I returned to work. I managed to get a job at the, the Mental Health Recovery Services Board as a, um, a, a research uh, assistant, as a consumer consistent. It, it, it wasn't really what was meaningful to me. The essence of the recovery center for me is that it was giving people opportunity for the recovery that I started to experience in my own life. Yeah. The things that I would create for myself, I wanted to be in place for others who maybe didn't have access to the same resources or um, weren't as fortunate to have, you know, some of the the, the pieces in their life that I had that, that were assets in my recovery. Right. So I started, I started saying, okay, let me look around the country. And at this time, as part of our recovery grants in Hamilton County, I was attending a lot of conferences um, for the first time. And so I was getting exposed to, you know, the who's who of recovery, which included the who's who of peer support. Yeah. And so I started being able to take that information and, and develop materials for Hampton County. The next step was to actually go ahead and develop uh, a grant proposal for a new peer center, a new consumer-run agency to replace the loss of the consumer network in case. And that, that grant came to a combination of funding from the Health Foundation in Cincinnati, which is now Interact for Health, mm -hmm. and the Smart Health Recovery Services Board. And I borrowed, um, there were, uh, very intentionally, there were things that I wanted to see be different for this recovery center mm -hmm. um, from, from previous uh, consumer agencies. And not, that's not to say that the, in a negative 
why you tend to think it, is that things have shifted and so it allowed for new opportunities. Yeah. Right. Historically, the sister agencies were kind of this place that, that, that they would get, you know, a little bit of money to go ship there, you know, and I don't know if you've ever heard, if you're familiar with Pat Deegan and any of her work, um, but, you know, she talked about the smoke and coke syndrome, where people would sit around in their football bugs and smoke cigarettes and drink pop all day. Right. Mm-hmm. But, but not necessarily get better. Yeah. Because they were connecting, to, they were there together, but they were there with a focus on how sick they were. Yeah. Um, not with a focus on how well they could become. And so the recovery mm-hmm. center was very intentionally uh, um, put in place with the, the, the need for a shift in the focus, the mindset shift. And some of the some of the consumers, the peers from back then, that were a part of you know the, the consumer network and, and Cape, were out of all, they were very strongly against this because we were introducing something that was unfamiliar and uncomfortable. Yeah. And and so they were being asked to see things differently, even though for decades they had been told that these things aren't possible. Right. Mm-hmm. But the new people came in and they embraced it, and the recovery center flourished pretty quickly. Um, it was it was intentionally set up as a structured environment where people weren't going to come and just hang out all day, but they were going to have uh, activities to participate in that were going to be focused on either um, developing a new skill I mean, or, or gaining new knowledge. Um, you know, it was on the idea that it was going to be a positive change. And, it, and so we borrowed from some of the national experts, and that was the Boston Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, mm-hmm. which is still up today um, yeah. as a leader in the industry. Meta Services is now Recovery International, and Village Integrated Services. And and the reason that the were the framework for the recovery center is that they brought practices and principles and a foundation um, that that allowed for um, a completely new opportunity and experience for people um, dealing with with any type of mental health condition. So it sounds like you were able you were able to take pieces from different programs that were working, and incorporate exactly. all, all of them. Okay. Exactly, and we, we you know we we looked at what was working well in those environments, um, what didn't we think would work in the in, in Hams County in a peer environment because none of those environments were peer run, and mm-hmm. that was a distinct difference. Okay. The recovery center is to run, but Boston Center, Meta Services, Village, those are traditional provider agencies. They import a large amount of peers, but they were not consumer run agencies. Okay. So we you know, we had to be certain that what we were gonna bring into a peer environment made sense for a peer environment. Right. Uh, but the most important part of all of it really truly really was just the shift in philosophy, the you know, mm-hmm. uh, going from the traditional medical model to recovery model of care or of service, you know, you go from things like the goal of stability or maintenance um, to growth. Right. You know, your foundation of hope. There's a belief that people can get better, and as a result, it more strength based and goal uh, growth oriented. And I, uh, I know. I'm sorry, I know you'll get there, Renee, but one of the things I love about your philosophy is that you believe that recovery is possible, that full recovery is is possible. Exactly, and I I know that there are still a a lot of people, including peers, who who don't believe recovery is possible for everyone, And, um, and I guess I kind of understand where they're coming from, but I actually believe recovery is possible for everyone. Now, I, the caveat in that is that recovery is something that we ourselves define. Right. Um, and and recovery is, looks differently for everyone. Um, and it's what I define as recovery for me is different than what either of you will define as recovery for yourself. Which is a really, and, really empowering philosophy. Right, because then it's individualized. Yeah. You know, there's no longer one size fits all. And 
that that is, was one of the driving forces for the recovery center is that it, you know I mentioned that it needed to be a structured environment that it was focused on curricula and you know activities that allowed for both but it was also really really important that there be a diverse uh, set of, of opportunities mm-hmm. because what helps one person in recovery isn't necessarily going to help someone else. Right. I was someone who needed things that were tied towards um, a change of behavior, more of your cognitive behavioral approach yeah. type things. Whereas I'm, some of my other peers were heavily benefiting from the arts. All they needed was the ability to express themselves through the arts. Mm. And, and they were very good at that. You know, the, the, the consumer art uh, community in Helms County has been strong for a lot of years. Yes. Uh, and it goes back to um, the, to the consumer movement. Actually, even before structured consumer agencies, we had something called the Moonlight Factory. And it was about um, consumer arts, including theater. So, oh, wow. you know, the Recovery Center wasn't intended to be like the previous consumer agencies, but it also was, it was very much so intended not just to replace, but to enhance, to take mm. what those organizations did and what they did well, um, continue to carry those things forward. And, and the best example of that would be the arts and uh, advocacy. Um, the, you know, the Consumer Network was a very strong advocacy organization. Um, and, and to not lose that and, and to make sure that's a part of the recovery center, but also to um, take advantage of the new resources that were available um, that were recovery oriented. Right. So that you know that's kind of how the recovery center came to be, and it was it was very much so designed to focus on on uh, all the aspects of a person's life, from you know being able to uh, the educational side of things to the personal growth side of things to you know the creative expression to to being a part of the community, um, the citizenship type thing. That's the other big shift. When I was coming through the system, the belief was that you know you you never leave services. You never that once you're uh, you know have a mental illness, you always have a mental illness. And, yeah. and 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 I wanted people to experience life outside of their mental illness. Yeah. I wanted people to be a part of their community. And the only way you can help people get there is to create opportunities to get there. Mm-hmm. And that's what the recovery center was designed to do. And so it's never been, in fact, it was specifically designed to be a stepping stone. It, it's a place for people that are willing to and able to engage in recovery, to come in, to work on improving their lives, to have some goals, to achieve those goals, and go out and live in their community. And to start being a, 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 someone who's, Life isn't just about their illness anymore, but it's about their their other interests in their lives, or their hobbies, or um, their family, or their friends, and it's and it expands who they are. So, yeah. and I think that's one of the things that Recovery Center has been very very successful with. Mm-hmm. Is, you know, the idea that someone can come into the center, be in that self absorbed state of woe is me, and and mm-hmm. and really not have much of a life outside of their their illness and the services that they receive and you know maybe their family to to have the light bulb come on and to realize that that they're in an environment that can equip them to get back to uh, parts of the life that they lost and to create uh, a, a, a new life that they hadn't even anticipated yeah. and and you know and that's the essence of um, what any an effective um, service environment would do, but I think peers do it better mm-hmm. in, in some ways. And, and that's not that's not a criticism of the service system. It's to say that the consumer agencies have opportunities that the traditional mental health service environment doesn't have. Um, you you don't have to have uh, services that are tied to uh, you know medical necessity for. A treatment plan, or you know, some credentialing body's regulation, um, or some billable allocation. You're able to meet people where they're at, and you're able to help them utilize their strengths to overcome their deficits. Right. And, and our traditional provider agencies do 
that too, but their 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 funding, their focus is, is heavily on the front end of helping people become stable and then helping people overcome and grow from that. And and they they don't necessarily have the resources or the freedom to really get into the, the types of things that the peer center can, where you're helping people establish um, new, uh, you know, new roles in life. Right, um, right. Yeah, that's when generally someone will graduate from the traditional treatment environment. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's so important, too, when you have the peer-on-peer -peer kind of relationship because they know, they've experienced it, you know, they've been in the darkness, they have that empathy, whereas, like, clinical services don't necessarily have the same empathy. They can have sympathy for you, but the empathy aspect isn't always there like it is with peers. So it makes the relationship, right. yeah, a lot better. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and you know, although um, I, I think, truth be told, a, a lot of, um, of people that are treatment providers become treatment providers because of their own experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we find that um, too. So, but I think that there's there's still a limitation. You have um, credentialing uh, regulations, you know, um, quote unquote, the the ethics of, of uh, you know, say for example, psychiatry or or counseling is such that they they're they don't necessarily have the freedom to disclose the way that you can in peer support. Mm, that's a great, that's a great comment. And so part of connecting is being able to share something that someone can grab a hold of. Yes. And clinicians have ethics regulations that prohibit some of that. Right. Or at least, or at least causes them to have to be very careful about how they go about doing it. Yeah. So, you know, there there's things that our treatment providers or system as a whole do that, that are wonderful and that they do great. I mean, that's the scale over at DCB and, you know, it's one of the best in the state. And, you know, we, we've got uh, several of our agencies that, that are the leaders in the state. But their limitation is the thing that makes the peer center so important. Their limitation is that they're not funded to be a friend. They're not funded to sit with. They're not funded to help someone in their life outside of their illness. Right. That that was my experience with case management was that it seemed that I was trying to be stabilized and just kept where I was. And, and you know, and that's, for, that's critical, obviously, for someone that comes in who's not stable. <laughs> It, right. It's kind of really sure. important to help them sure. be stable. Um, I don't have any, any concerns with that, um, and I have to probably at this point point out that I'm speaking as Renee Capacci, the consumer, not necessarily on the, uh, the values of the board, although I don't think they're inconsistent. But I think that for many individuals, um, the challenge is the maintenance. Yeah. And it's very difficult for someone to maintain when that main, that that situation they're in isn't a good situation right you know we maintain when we have something that we don't want to lose yeah so when i obtained something when, like for example when i went back and got it came off a of disability and got a job i had something i wanted to maintain right i i liked the idea that all of a sudden i wasn't living in poverty Mm-hmm. You know, I, I really learned to embrace that pretty quickly. And so I had a, an extra motivation to stay well. Right. That motivation is not there when all we're focusing on is helping someone to maintain. Yeah, you said it very well earlier when you said, you know, we didn't want the recovery center to be a place where people sat and talked about their illnesses. We wanted it to be a place where right. they worked on their recovery. Yeah, where they're, like you said, you said, focus on how well they can become. And I thought right. that that was really powerful. Yep. Yeah, and, and I think that part of the role of, you know, what, what peers do, and, and I think this is also something that um, peer support has kind of uh, had a, its own mindset shift over the past probably decade. It's not necessarily something I consider as being good, um, is that, you know, peer support oftentimes today is viewed as 
being the same as recovery. You know, it was equivalent with, and that it is recovery, and that recovery isn't anything other than that. And that's a huge danger. Yeah. Um, because one, peer support in and of itself isn't necessarily recovery oriented. It mm-hmm. normally is, but I've encountered peers over the years that are quite controlling. Mm-hmm. You know, that are um, not very optimistic, that are not very, um, you know, some people are just by nature very, very uplifting. And others are very critical. Yeah. Right. The ones that are very critical shouldn't be in the role of peer support, for example. Yeah. So, so it is really important to keep in mind that peer support is, um, it is, it's, it works well when it's provided within a framework of recovery. It's a mm-hmm. part of recovery, but there are many other recovery resources that can or that, that that don't necessarily require peer support. Peer support enhances it. Um, and I think it's also important to realize that, that peer support needs to be a mutual support. Um, it, 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 if it's a one-way relationship, it's probably not good. Yeah. Uh, although it can be at times because it could be someone that's just really truly needing um, a you know, more intense level of affirmation. And, and so sometimes it's, it may be lopsided, but it can still be mutual. Right. Um, it needs to be growth oriented. Um, I can remember so many times when I was going in and out of the hospital, and you know, and I I became quote unquote friends with the people I went in and out of the hospital with. And sometimes we'd get together, you know, every once in a while we'd have a campfire or something. And by the end of the evening, somebody was going to the hospital, and it's because we were always focused on how sick we were, mm-hmm. yeah. and we took off each other's sicknesses. We did we weren't focus on lifting each other up or helping each other. Right. And so that that becomes a key, you know, factor in effect of their support is how do we help people? Um, and how do we, uh, you know, and a huge piece of that is helping people connect. And, and we always think of connection just as socially. The connection is connecting intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, you know, it, it's a holistic approach. And so and it's about the whole person, not just the mental illness or the, the, the mental health part of that person. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just the biggest thing I think the, the challenge for the recovery center, not not just the recovery center, any peer center, is that there be an independent from um, in, in, in not only in operation but in philosophy, and that. There, that individuals and organizations not be come trapped with, with what's being uh, phrased co co-optation, where they start taking on the, the appearance of uh, what you see in clinical environment. And all of a sudden the peers aren't, um, maybe not even providing a typical peer service, but more so that they're starting to change their language. And I, every once in a while I do, which good, I hear people will say things like, my clients. Mm-hmm. Um, my class, you know, kind of possessive. Right. Um, it's it's the word client. I don't know that that fits real well in a peer environment. Um, so I think it's sometimes the, the the challenge for peer centers is to check themselves and to be true to their own their missions, not the systems missions or uh, the state's missions in some cases. Um, you know. It, why do you do it? I think that's another thing for people to think about when when it falls on the stagnation. Um, it's usually usually the thing we go back and ask is okay, what's what are what did we do well that maybe isn't going well now, or what do we need to change? Yeah. Um, asking truly, why why do we do this? Yeah. I mean, for me personally, it's I, my focus has always been on creating opportunities. Mm-hmm. I've been blessed to experience full recovery. I've been blessed to, you know, come out of, you know, living on four hundred forty-four dollars a month on disability and having a career. I want others to have that opportunity. I want to get that. I actually even think it's a responsibility for those of us to experience recovery. I think we have the responsibility to create opportunities for others. I love yeah. that statement. Um, that, that's very powerful. I I agree with you one hundred percent. And, and so, you know, the, the, the 
recovery center has that opportunity. The warm line has that opportunity. My divine wellness center has that opportunity. Um, and I think the thing that, in, in for all all consumer run agencies, or even uh, peer programs, peer run programs within traditional agencies, I think one of the things that I always challenge people to do is to make sure that keeping yourselves focused on both. Um, the staff, especially, but the entity as a whole. I mean, what is the entity going to to grow? Right. Um, because just like you don't want maintenance and stability for a person in you know in service, you don't want maintenance and stability for your organization. Yep. Right. And that's one of the things that we run into here. And you know, we've had this conversation before. You know, Chris, Chris's statement. I like you, but my job is to get rid of you. <laughs> and that that looks different for for everyone. Exactly. I mean, the recovery center peer support. One of the things that we say is peer support right now because of the whole uh, growth in the certified sort of peer specialists throughout the state. I think overall that's a great thing. I think one of the things is though is that people um, feel like all they can do is peer support that they're still embedded in the system. Mm. That they still don't have outside. They don't have a life in the community, mm. and so I think that it's really important to keep them regularly assess. Why am I doing this? Um, and what are my what are my huge goals as an individual peer provider, but also as an organization? What are the goals of the organization? Yes. You know, it, it, how, how do we make this organization grow? And and that's the thing that that always allows uh, peer centers to. Not just the thing, but the thrive. Mm, yes. Renee. And that's, that's the challenge for the recovery center. And how do you see us taking that challenge on going forward? I mean, I think that, that it's been happening. I mean, I think that the recovery center, um, there's a very diverse staff at the center. I yes. think it's important that, that all of the staff um, know the history of the consumer movement and not lose that. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, moving forward, you take advantage of the technology. And I think you guys have done a great job with that. You know, this pandemic, um, because you were already kind of moved in this direction, you were able to put some stuff in place that other organizations struggled with. Um, but, but also, I think ultimately it's you know, constantly assessing not only your sense of an organization, but the community needs and asking, can, is this a need we can meet? Um, is this a need we want to meet? Uh, and then if so, how do we do it? How do we integrate? It? How do we do what we do well uh, on an ongoing basis? How do we tweak what we don't do well? Mm -hmm. um, and then what is the need that we're just not doing that we could meet? Mm. And I think you know your limits. Yeah. You're a small organization and it's still a relatively young organization. And so it's not, I wouldn't recommend that any peer agency that's of your age and size try to take on the world. Um, <laughs> right. you know, take on, if you take on too much, then you don't have the, the ability to give any of it uh, the necessary time yeah. um, and attention. So, you know, do what you do well. Um, and and the best way that you know you're doing it well is to ask the people that are there, yeah. you know, that are coming to the recovery center, what do they like? What don't they like? If, if they tell you what they don't like, how would they change it so that it would be better? Yeah. That's exactly right. And we, we try to make it a very empowering environment for people um, to to tell us what they need so that we can learn how to provide that. And I think the other part of any peer center that um, thrives is that that there must be a huge um, gap between the staff and the, the members as far as the hierarchy, um, and that just as the members are there um, engaged in health and wellness, that the staff continue to do the same. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's, I mean, the, the peer services have been around for a very, very long time. Actually, you know, centuries ago, so it's not really new. It's just changed and keeps changing. And I think that with every change, the center just has to ask, is this a change that we like? Right. And if so, 
then how do you how do you implement it? If not, then don't go down that road. Yeah, definitely. A lot of your philosophy seems to be based on the premise that it's it's very important to take a, a microscopic look at what you're doing as you're doing it and see what's working and continually change. And I think that we're yeah. trying we're trying to do that as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, on both an individual and an organizational level, that's, you know, that's the, you look at the leaders, leadership that's been very effective, you're going to see that part of the um, portfolio. So, and, you know, the, the center's been blessed to have stability. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's something that I think in part is there because the environment's been there to allow people to feel good about staying. Mm -hmm. um, but but there's no doubt that that stability um, is is such that uh, it 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 opens up a comfort level to take on new tasks and, and uh, try new things. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know, it, 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 you. I, well, let me say one other thing. The, the other thing I think you're doing very well, and then you just have to probably give some thought around um, how, how to connect better with the, the other players, so to speak, is, is the, the outreach and the involvement of um, your younger um, yeah, population. Not just transition, transition age youth, but, um, but, you know, historically, consumer agencies have attracted you know, the membership or participants that were in their 40s and 50s and 60s and above, and actually, frankly, probably heavily 50s, 60s and above. And so to be able to see someone in their you know, 20s come in or 30s come in and, 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 you know, not only come through the door, but to engage and participate and, and have significant life changes, um, is, is, a, is a good thing, and it, it's meeting a need that is probably bigger than what um, most people recognize. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think the the younger demographic is definitely where we kind of need to hone in on as well. Just basically from my personal experience with being in college and seeing how college impacts people, and even younger than college, especially in the deve developmental years. So it's definitely important that we have something implemented at the center to get people in here. And I've talked with Bill and I've talked with Chris about, you know, some specific things that we can do to make people feel more comfortable when they come to the center in ways that we can get people in here. Um, it's just, it's, it's definitely a hard demographic to try to pinpoint because people can be stubborn, they can be opinionated, things are stigmatized. So um, it's definitely a challenge we're, we're trying to tackle at this point. And we've, we've kind of gone through a, a, a little process of really when whenever we had a transitional age youth or someone in their in their 20s or 30s come in the building we were a full stop you know let's find out where they came from how they got here why they're here and what they're looking for um because right. we're trying to replicate that yeah right yeah and, and i think the challenge is that um the, those individuals come in they have different desires different goals different needs um it, it, their their understandings of of the navigating the world are very different from the rest of the recovery center population, and so the the challenge is to make um, all everyone there comfortable. Yes. And, yeah. And you know, someone that is in their their early twenties is going to be somebody that's technology driven, for example. Yeah. Whereas someone in their fifties and sixties, um, that's a different different life experience for them. That's and so, true. but the the. So the challenge is to find the common ground yep. and to take advantage of that common ground. That's a great statement. And I think that what you said earlier about the um, the arts and how arts is really healing, I think that could definitely be a, a good way that we kind of hone in on that common ground because I think art is something that we can all kind of find solace in. Yeah, and it's so cathartic. Art's something that has been a huge part of the recovery center, and yeah. it's something that we're good at. We're, we're very blessed to have Jerry. Hey, Mary. Uh, and Mary. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, you know, Hamilton County is just coming a couple of years off of, you know, nine million dollar grant for transitional age youth, you know, the journey grant. So, you know, the, you, perhaps you reach out to the the other 
um, the agencies that, that have carried on that project because, you know, they're, they're the ones that are currently serving transitional age youth in our community. Um, establish maybe a relationship with them so that if there's, maybe it's a special program. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe it's an evening program. I don't know. But it's, it is something that I think that um, is a challenge, but I think that you guys are, uh, it's, it's encouraging to see um, younger people into the recovery center. Yes, very much so. Renee, who are those other other players that, that we should be paying attention to who are serving that demographic now? Um, I don't think I know all of them. I know that the primary players would be uh, White House Youth Services, uh, Calvert House, and um, uh, uh, the Greater Cincinnati Herald. Right. Um, uh, White House Youth Services, obviously, being the, the one that's uh, you know, they're serving individuals that are still under 18 um, heavily, but they're also helping with any type of transitional living skills like housing and all of that stuff, um, help, sit, helping people either finish their education at the high school level or engaging at the college level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Those are some um, things that, that we've talked about trying to do, um, kind of classes on adulting. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, like you talk about, don't focus on the illness, focus on the recovery and what we can do better. And that's why we offer things like WHAM, where we talk about adding good things to our routine instead of taking away the bad things. Yeah, and I've noticed that through RC After Dark, that, that chapter that we're doing, that, that the consistency is there, that the people that we have been able to kind of reel in and take under our wing, like they've stayed, like the yeah. consistency is there, like they enjoy it, they like attending these things, and they keep coming back. It's just reaching out and getting more and more people involved. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm not real familiar with what's in the, especially not in the private sector in the community uh, when it comes to the, the younger populations. That, um, but, I mean, I, I, I think obviously the other big challenge is that there's, there's a bigger need um, than what Recovery Center or any other one peer center can fill. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're focused. If you're funding your focus is primarily on people dealing with serious mental illness, and and yet the one of the reasons the recovery center was conceptualized to begin with was I experienced that where I was I was in college and I you know until I um, you know became really sick <laughs> you know I was in private care and then they said oh you're too sick yeah and send you to public care and so there's a there's a, a fine line there, I guess, where the, the goal should be that we help people avoid hitting, you know, that label of severe mental illness, yeah. yet, yet the funds are so limited that oftentimes that's the population that um, makes its way to the public mental health system. Yeah. yeah, I really like that we've changed our wording on our, on our uh, mission so that now, you know, we, and I don't know that we ever did, but we don't ask for a diagnosis when someone comes in. Um, we just ask that you self-identify as someone who would like something to be different about their mental processes. Yeah, because everybody has mental health. You know, everybody can right. work towards it. And I think, like you said, Renee, early intervention is super important. Right. Now, the challenge with that, of course, being that down the road, um, you know, it's transitioning towards Medicaid billable services. You have to have a diagnosis. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, but you don't have to ask it as, as, you know, as soon as they walk through the door. Right. I mean, I think part of being creative is, is being to think about when, when you ask what. Mm. Ex expand on that a little bit. Well, I mean, you have to have a, a general intake, obviously. Um, there's certain information that as a contract provider, um, you're obligated to, to gather. But you can gather that at different points. Points. I mean, if someone's coming in for a tour, then then your interaction is primarily about what their needs are, who they are, where, are they eligible, um, those types of things. If they come back, then maybe it's a little bit more information, um, you know, the, meeting the required, um, you know, gathering the required information, and, and doing it in a way that is, allows them to feel um accepted into the environment that allows them to feel comfortable in the environment, then it's not threatening to give that information. Yeah. That's a good statement. Definitely. Yeah, you know, most people, frankly, a lot, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people don't know their diagnosis. Yeah. 
for you know better or worse a lot of people just don't know and a lot of people who do know have no hesitation sharing it because they've done it over and over and over again in their life Mm -hmm. true i think i think the challenge is to help people understand that regardless of what that label is the recovery center is not about the label the recovery center is about what they're experiencing and what they want to overcome you know, what are the things that, that are interfering with their lives? Yes. Those are the things the recovery center is designed to help them with. Yeah. I like the way Chris says it, you know, we're, we're here to give you back those pieces of your life that you've lost to your illness. Or, or create pieces um, that they just never had the opportunity because of life circumstances. Very good statement. You're right. Renee, thank you very much for, for going through the entire ideology of the uh, the movement and the recovery center. We appreciate it very much. Yeah, it's really great no I mean, is there anything else that... Um, I think we can open up the floor to any questions anyone watching may have. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, you answered pretty much all of the questions that I had written down, so thank you for that. But... Also, one question I wanted to ask, just for me personally and for what I'm doing for the Recovery Center, what is your long-term vision for the Recovery Center um, and or has it already been achieved? Uh, Well, it has not been completely achieved, but the long-term vision for the Recovery Center is that um, that obviously that it it needs, I I didn't have a set volume, but it needs a high volume of needs, of people with needs. But, it, but ultimately, that the people that come through the doors um, are all, all go out the doors yeah. um, to, to a better circumstance and that they go out the doors to life in the community so that it truly be a stepping stone. And I know that, especially early on when the recovery center, I mean, some of the folks that, that came in are people that were uh, part of, um, you know, social clubs or um, day programs. And so they came in through a system where for, you know, potentially decades, their daily routine was to go to a program. And so the recovery center became that program. Mm-hmm. It's um, life beyond uh, the center, so to speak. But that ultimately is the goal, is that in my mind, that, 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 or that people have a different role at the center than they did when they first came in, i.e. employment or something like that. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, the goal was to give people access to resources that would allow them to have um, a life in the community. You guys are, I mean, Amanda, especially, you're pretty young, but, you know, the song that I use a lot when I do presentations is Hotel California. <laughs> and the system not be the Hotel California, that we truly prepare people and allow people to leave. Yeah. That's, that's a really powerful statement. Yeah, that is. Cool. All right. So another thing that I wanted to ask you, if money wasn't an option, what would you want to do with the recovery center? Oh gosh, <laughs> you got another hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think that I, a lot of it would be expanding on what's already in place. Mm-hmm. But a big thing that unfortunately there's always been hesitancy. Um, I think probably tied primarily to liability, uh, but it would be uh, creating opportunity for recovery center and have a, a, uh, a program that's really truly um, taking people to the outdoors, mm. whether that be through um, you know, travel or hiking or camping, uh, photography, you know, anything of that, that nature, because there's lots and lots of research that shows that you know, the people that spend time in the outdoors, out in nature, um, tend to live longer and they tend to be emotionally well. And so that would be one thing that certainly I would find a way to get it, 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 it become a part. I mean, and the other thing is I think there would be multiple campuses. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I've always envisioned that the recovery center wouldn't just be one building because um, people at different points in their recovery have different needs. Yeah. And so what we know works for someone who is, you know, struggling to have hope, which is kind of the early stages or the beginning of recovery, is yeah. very different from what someone who, who's reached that point where they're taking total responsibility for the health and well-being, and they just need 
the resources to, to develop the skills and, and, and have connections to the community that allow them to live, literally to live life outside of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, the, having different locations and, you know, uh, I would be probably remiss if I ignored the, the, the long-time goal of some of the current and former staff, especially uh, Angela, would be uh, a peer respite. Yep. You That's... know, that, that when peers are struggling, that, that instead of um, having them wait for some crisis to come, that they have a place to go and stay overnight. Um, in an environment that is supportive. And that's, um, that's something that our friends at the Holistic Mental Health Network are, are really exactly. uh, trying to work on as well. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if money weren't a challenge and if, if there weren't all of the, you know, the barriers of um, liability and all of those fun things, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things that would get put in place. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting you say the outdoor programs thing because, um, David commented on our live stream and said field trips, which that was the first thought that came onto my mind, and I think that's a great idea. Also, through Magic, who we're currently working with, we're, we're thinking about doing um, we, we, plots. We actually have two plots on uh, Albion that we'll be, um, we'll be planting and uh, basically farming in the spring and summer. Right, yeah, stuff like that would be great. And, you know, and if, for a variety of reasons. One, it gives the people, uh, puts them in a position, an opportunity for them to give back. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and to, to be a part of a community, I mean, because I think that's an important thing to instill in the the people that come to the recovery centers. Hey, you're coming, you're benefiting, you're growing. It doesn't stop there. You also have uh, the opportunity and and to give. And when you give, you grow. Yeah, yes, definitely. We just talking about that yesterday. So, and this this, yeah, so, this really is the first time uh, since I've been here that we will have a class or two that are actually part of the community at large because we'll be gardening with other people from the Mount Auburn community who are not involved in the mental health field. Yeah, and the cool thing about yeah. that is you get to see the growth. Like, you get to see the work that you're putting in, you get to see these things grow, and you get to, like, feel proud that you contributed to something like that. Absolutely. That's what I love about gardening. Right. So, I mean, there's, you know, go get some more money. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Renee, thank you so very much for your time and, and for your, your care and for everything that you do for us. We really appreciate it very much. Yep, I appreciate everything you guys are doing and, and just keep going, but um, never put a lid on it. Never put a lid on it. I like that. Thank you. Keep on keeping on. That's what we're going to do. All right. Thank All you right, so much, Renee. Great. We appreciate it. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. She is so smart. She's awesome. Thank you guys so much for tuning in for us to um, talk with Renee. That was a really great conversation. Um, definitely taught me a lot more about the recovery center that I didn't originally know, um, which is really cool, especially the grassroots consumer movement and things like that. Um, that's definitely really important things to look at. I definitely have a lot of really good information that I can work off with to um, help help you guys you yeah. know, have a better experience here and things that we can do to kind of connect with you and get you back out to the community and things like that. I think that's super important. Let's talk uh, really quickly about next week. Um, we're going to have a guest next week named uh, Bethany Iser. Bethany is the chairwoman and the founder of the Cures Foundation, which is um, to fight schizophrenia. And she wrote a book called Mind Estranged, which Amanda is showing you now. And we're going to be giving away some copies of the book, which is really wonderful. It's a, her story about her experience with schizophrenia. She was uh, attending, she's from Cincinnati, and she was attending the University of Southern California on a scholarship and uh, had a break from reality and ended up living in the library for a couple of years. Wow. Yeah. And uh, her, her journey has been incredible, and she's recovered now. And so she's going to come and talk about her experience, and we're going to send you guys uh, some books. That's great. Yeah, really exciting stuff, you guys. It's going to be awesome. So make sure you tune into that live next week because it may not be around after we record it live. That's one of the recordings that we may have to get rid of after just for confidentiality purposes and um, just for Bethany. Thank you for mentioning that. You're right. Yeah, so if you do want to be involved in that conversation, it will not be available after we post it. Well, at least part of it 
will not be depending on how long that we talk to her the whole thing may not be able to be used it just depends so make sure you tune in live with her so you get all of what she says all of the whole experience you're here to ask questions and have conversation yeah anything else i think it was really good yeah i thought it was really good um we have about five more minutes if you guys want to call in with any questions for us the line is open and we are ready for your phone call but if not that is okay we can just end it here I'm really excited about everything that we're doing, guys. We should hopefully be back in here sooner rather than later, but I guess we're going to have to just play by ear. And the, the last thing, how about the uh, shout-out from Renee Kavachi to Amanda for all the work that you're doing? That, <laughs> that was really cool. Yeah, that that's, was really... That's a, that's a friend in high places. Yeah, that was definitely made me feel good. Because I often went with my you know, mental illness and my diagnosis and things like that. I often like struggle with admiration and, and validation and things like that. Yeah, exactly. And so it's really, it's actually, it's actually my homework in therapy this week to um, really let the compliments sink in and to celebrate them. I so like that. good, good for you. Yeah. That's so nice. every time somebody compliments or give you any sort of validation or admiration, I'm supposed to do a small victory dancer whatever to kind of let it sink in because then the pattern is repeated in your brain and then you get that release of serotonin and then you really like start to feel it um, because that's something I've struggled with my whole life is not being able to feel you know good when other people say good things about me mm -hmm. um, so it was really cool that you know she said that because now I can after we all wrap up I can go and celebrate and do my little dance yeah, um, yep. so, victory dance, I like yeah, it. Yeah, that's really cool. So we definitely got a lot of great insight from Renee about you know what we're doing well, what we can do better, and what we can do for the future for you guys, because that's why we're here. I, we did a 10-year a, a plan with a consultant two years ago, and uh, we talked about having a campus. You know, Chris would love to have a campus. Oh my God, that would be amazing. Yeah, with a vocational center to get people working and, and have some kind of social enterprise uh, where we're actually hiring people to, to train them to work and then get them out in the community. That would be fantastic. So we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, because like, like we say, like Renee said, like Chris always says, our job is to get you out of here. We love you, we love spending time with you, we love to see your smiling faces every day. We love to see your progress being made and we love to see you making strides to better yourself. But we want to get you back in the community. We want to get you back living life in all its glory and you know feeling good and having accomplishments and you know things like that, so. Thank you guys very, very much for your time, and uh, stick around. We'll be doing a 2.45 um, check-in, and David's got uh, bipolar and depression support group at, at 1.30. 30. All right, yep. Yeah. We'll see you guys later. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Oh, I was going to try to stop on my computer.